Let us worship God. Psalm 148, which is 135 in the hymn book, but we, we don't sing the last verse, the doxology. It's saying that people of all ages, all shapes and sizes, all creatures on earth, should give praise to God, and so do we. 135, the Lord of heaven confess, verses 1 to 5. This is a day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Let us pray. Lord, this is a day that you have made, and this is a day that you have given to us for our enjoyment, that we should use it well, for our obedience, that we should serve you in it, for our remembrance of others in our prayers and in our actions, for our work, for worship too is work which makes its own demands upon us, and for our growth, that we should grow up more nearly into your will and into our maturity. And so we come to you, Lord, in worship, in thanksgiving and out of our need for you. We come, some of us, as families, as men and women and boys and girls, because we are far more to give thanks for than we deserve because we've known, some of us, security and joy and contentment and meaningful our lives. And it is of your giving, Father, and we have no one to thank but you. We come, some of us, from our domestic problems, from the tangle of our relationships to your wisdom. We come from our disappointment with life as it is, with what we ourselves have made of it and what others have done to us, for your forgiveness or for your healing. We come from the somberness of what daily we read and hear and see, with apprehension, some of us, for the week ahead, how we will cope, whether we will be adequate. So also he taught us thus to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to the temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Next week, next week the autumn season, as it were, begins when Sunday school starts up and breakfast club starts up and all sorts of things start up. So this is the last of these occasional things that we call a family service. And family, of course, is a very mixed kind of entity, isn't it? Some of you are here as families, and many of us are not here as families, or not as complete families. And yet we all of us are here, more or less, as households or as units in ourselves. And if we're lucky enough to have children with us, or if we're lucky enough as children to have older people with us, then good enough, but we are part of a family. And it's about family that rather ramblingly, I think, we're going to be thinking in the course of today, and also in question of age. How old are you? Well, you know that, you know that. Maybe other people don't. It's a curious thing how Sometimes ashamed we are and sometimes proud of our age. When you're five and a half and someone asks you, or five and a quarter, and someone asks you what age you are, you say, I'm nearly six. And if you're around 12 or 13, you want to give the impression that you're at least 16 or 17. And when you're in your middle years, you possibly want to give the impression that you are just a little bit younger, and maybe you spend more time in the sports center or the hairdresser to establish that. And when you get well up in years, then you're not beyond adding just three or four years to your age, beyond the stage of wonderful considering. It's a curious thing, this of age. 
Age doesn't really matter. What age would you like to be? One year older so that you could sit the driving test? Five years older so that you could go to certain films that you can't go to at the moment? Five years older so that you wouldn't have to pass the exams, you'd have them all behind you? Five years younger so that that big mistake you made you'd have time to live through again and not make it next time. Ten years more so that you could retire. Forty years less so that you could start doing an awful lot of things in a different way if you had the chance. That American philosopher, one of whose hymns I think is in our hymn book, Oliver Wendell Holmes, when he was 92, was heard once to sigh as a pretty girl walked past. What wouldn't I give to be 70 again? <laughs> Age is uh, an indeterminate kind of thing. The only day that matters, the only age possibly that matters, is the age we are now. This is the day that the Lord has made. You are the age that God in his mercy has given to you. People older than you will envy you that you are that age. People younger than you may wish that they were just as you are. This is the day. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We're going to sing 105 in Songs of God's People. I think we'll just sing the first two verses of it, unless we sing it very badly, in which case we'll have to sing the third one too. 105, verses 1 and 2, and Ian Campbell up there will play it, I know, with great vigour. This morning I'm going to do a bit of talking. We're going to do quite a bit of singing. But more than usually, we're going quite simply to read the Bible, or have it read to us, and I hope follow it, follow it in our own text. So if the Bible was within reach, would you reach out for it? And the readings today are being taken by Nigel Thompson. The first reading is taken from the first book of Samuel, chapter 3 at the first verse. That will be found on page 267 of the Good News Bibles. 1 Samuel chapter 3 at verse 1. In those days when the boy Samuel was serving the Lord under the direction of Eli, there were very few messages from the Lord and visions from him were quite rare. One night, Eli, who was now almost blind, was sleeping in his own room. Samuel was sleeping in the sanctuary where the sacred covenant box was. Before dawn, while the lamp was still burning, the Lord called Samuel. He answered, yes, sir, and ran to Eli and said, you called me and here I am. But Eli answered, I, I, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. So Samuel went back to bed. The Lord called Samuel again. The boy did not know that it was the Lord because the Lord had never spoken to him before. So he got up, went to Eli and said, You called me and here I am. But Eli answered, My son, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. The Lord called Samuel a third time. He got up, went to Eli and said, You called me and here I am. Then Eli realized that it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So he said to him, Go back to bed. And if he calls you again, say, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed. The Lord came and stood there and called as he had before, Samuel, Samuel, 
Samuel answered, Speak, your servant is listening. Amen. Poor Samuel, he was sent away from home, terribly young, to live in a temple. He was his parents' only child, and they, they sent him away to give him a good beginning in life, and I wonder if he was happy in it. It's an old tradition, I won't say in this country, it's an old tradition in, in England, that the better born and the better bred were, and to some extent still are, sent off at a terribly early age out of the nest to prep school or public school, boarding school, whatever you call it, and only maybe come back at holiday time. And there are people here whose parents were missionaries and who saw their parents only very occasionally, if they were lucky once a year, when they might be able to go out and join them in China or in India or in Africa, or less often when their parents came back, would they grow up without them? What is the best age to be, I wonder? If you don't have your family around you, perhaps it's not always the best age, whatever it is, but you adapt yourself to it. I don't think your school years are the best years of your life. They were not the best years of my life, though I enjoyed them on the whole, but I've enjoyed other years later, better, because at school you're under an awful lot of pressure and competition that we were talking about a few, years, a few weeks ago. And the pressure's always on. And you're not always sure about who your friends are and you make new friends and you lose them and so on. It's not before your school years either, I don't think, because then you don't really know whether you're happy or not. I can remember being in my cot when I was very small and I can remember the bars beside it, and I can remember being wrapped up, I suppose, in a shawl very tightly, and being terribly hot, and bawling my head off, and not able to move, and nobody came. That's probably my first memory. I don't know how old I may have been. But first memories aren't always happy memories. And even later on, what are the best years of your life? What are the most important years of your life? I read a, a, a review of a biography of a very famous man just quite recently, and it referred in passing to the years that he spent from the age of 16 to 25, and he said, which are, of course, the most important years in a man's life? Well, maybe they are. They're maybe not always the happiest years. Remember that in wartime, it is people often who were still in their teens who did the fighting, or the flying, and the dying often, before they ever really had the chance to live at all. An old gentleman in the Errol Haig home round in Minter Street was laid to rest under the Union flag ten days ago. And he had enlisted in the year 1915. At the age of 16, but if the records were right, he wasn't even 16 at the time. And he fought in Mesopotamia in the machine gun corps and in France and in Flanders. And then it is there in our parish. And there are people in this congregation who had a far greater responsibility for the life and death of other people before they were 21 than perhaps they have ever had since. The important years of your life, you, you can't really judge, I can't really tell. And if I asked you, those of you who are older, when the happiest years of your life were, I think you might have difficulty. You'd say it wasn't years, it was special events or special weeks or special days. And people can be of, of all ages and still know that kind of peace, fulfillment. Three old people of our congregation had 90th birthdays, or 90 plus, during this past week. And they're all, I think, people who have found contentment and serenity on the whole. And one old lady, ten days ago, 
on her 99th birthday, and many of you know who that is, on her 99th birthday, I held her hand and said a little prayer for her. And then she held my hand and most beautifully said a prayer for herself and also for me. And it came wholly from her heart. There are people who are very unhappy at an early age, and sometimes in their school years. There are people who are unhappy in their older years because they're afraid or they're not well. You and I are incredibly fortunate people because whatever we sometimes feel in our own hearts or when we lie awake at night or waken early or when a new term is just going to begin and when we're not sure of what lies ahead of us, we are able to be out here, we're able to sing praises, we're able to talk to our friends, we're able to move about we're able to get around. We are the fortunate people, and most of us are fortunate because we also belong to families of one kind or another, and all of us to this big family, which is the Church of Christ. But it is the same God whom we worship, whether we are, as some next week will for the first time, coming to a Sunday school and to worship for the first time, or whether, like some, we have sung praises to God week after week and year after year for many decades. It is the same God in childhood, man and womanhood, age and death, whom we depend upon. And there's one hymn that we sometimes sing for children, and those of us who count ourselves as children, of course, can sing it, and so we should, But others of us who are much older might also want to sing it in the same way because it means us too. We're saying, Jesus, friend of little children, be a friend to me as well because I need you all the way from the beginning of my life to the end of it. And that hymn is number 100. We'll sing it now. One of the most telling passages in the whole Bible is addressed to young people, and it's also addressed to old people. There's no perfect age to be. To be young has its own pressures and its own difficulties, and you know that you're going to pass out of being young quite soon, but it has its own challenges, as we say. And to be old has its limitations and its challenges too. And we're going to hear that now, please, a passage that brings these two together quite unforgettably. You may want to follow it in your book. The passage in question is from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 11, at verse 9, reading to the end of chapter 12. That's to be found on page 661 of the Bibles in the pews. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, at verse 9. Young people, enjoy your youth. Be happy while you are still young. Do what you want to do and follow your heart's desire. But remember that God is going to judge you for whatever you do. Don't let anything worry you or cause you pain. You aren't going to be young very long. So remember your Creator while you are still young, before those dismal days and years come when you will say, I don't enjoy life. That is when the light of the sun, the moon, and the stars will grow dim for you and the rain clouds will never pass away. Then your arms that have protected you will tremble And your legs, now strong, will grow weak. Your teeth will be too few to chew your food and your eyes too dim to see clearly. Your ears will be deaf to the noise of the street. You will barely be able to hear the mill as it grinds or music as it plays. But even the song of a bird will wake you from sleep. You will be afraid of high places and walking will be dangerous. Your hair will turn white, 
you will hardly be able to drag yourself along and all desire will have gone. We are going to our final resting place and then there will be mourning in the streets. The silver chain will snap and the golden lamp will fall and break. The rope at the well will break and the water jar will be shattered. Our bodies will return to the dust of the earth and the breath of life will go back to God who gave it to us. Useless Useless, said the philosopher, it is all useless. But because the philosopher was wise, he kept on teaching the people what he knew. He studied proverbs and honestly tested their truth. The philosopher tried to find comforting words, but the words he wrote were honest. The sayings of wise men are like the sharp sticks that shepherds use to guide sheep and collected proverbs are as lasting as firmly driven nails. They have been given by God, the one shepherd of us all. My son, there is something else to watch out for. There is no end to the writing of books, and too much study will wear you out. But after all this, there is only one thing to say. Have reverence for God and obey his commands because this is all that man was created for. God is going to judge everything we do, whether good or bad, even things done in secret. Amen. Whatever, whatever else you remember from today's service, you'll probably remember about Mark studying, wearing you out, and, and be prepared to quote it where necessary at home. I've got a book at home called Book of Ages, written by Desmond Morris, the man who wrote man watching and animal watching and all those things. And it takes each year of the possible age that you could be, from one right up to well, about a hundred. It says what, um, what happens at that age usually and also what certain people have achieved at that age. So that you get Elizabeth Taylor having her first appearance on the stage at the age of three. And Mozart playing the harpsichord at the age of three. And a famous philosopher called John Stuart Mill who wrote a history of Rome at the age of six and a half. And what other people, famous painters like Monet painting his incomparable water lilies at 84, and Picasso still drawing at the age of 90. You can't really judge what people will do by what age they are. Just as you can't judge what people will do by the families that they belong to. To belong to a normal family, as we sometimes talk about, is of course a great blessing. But it's not a necessity because there are far fewer normal families in the sense of everybody being together, sitting in a family pew in church, than ever there were before. Families break up for one reason or another, sometimes sad reasons, sometimes good reasons. Some people can't wait to get away from their families and go and study somewhere or to go into a flat. All sorts of things happen to families. And there are families that in Europe today, where people by the million have lost contact most tragically with one another and will only hope and pray that they may meet up again. And there are old people who in this generation don't expect or even want to live with the children or the grandchildren. Very important people, very high profile people sometimes become recluses in their later years like Greta Garbo and simply hole up with a cat and above all nowadays with a television. And in our own community there are far more people than many of us realize whom we never see because they live just quite simply, quite quietly by themselves and sometimes are perfectly happy to do so. 
And some people who have done most for other people are folk who have never had a, a good family or even a happy beginning, but have made up for it wonderfully in what they've done for other people later on. There was a legendary dancer on the palace stage in between the walls called Josephine Baker, and she had a lurid background and a lurid early part of her life, but much the greater part of her life was spent with her, what she called her rainbow family, the great household of children from all countries whom she looked after, sacrificed for, loved, and, and gave a home to. And there was another legendary entertainer called Billie Holiday, who had a, a desperately nightmarish life all the way through. But her great desire, she said in her autobiography, was that she never achieved it, poor thing, because she died very young. But her hope was that she might one day have a big house and she would fill it with children who had never been loved, just as she had never been loved as a child, and she'd give them freedom and love and a home and security, such as her own childhood had never offered. I think that, in fact, her autobiography began with the not unmemorable words, when my mama and my papa got married, he was 18 and she was 16 and I was three. There are people who have had a most impossible beginning to life, but they've not said because I've had a bad beginning to life, therefore life owes me everything and I'm not going to put anything back into it. Sometimes because life was like that, they've made life glorious and wonderful and creative and fulfilling for other people. I wonder, what kind of family would you choose to be in? What would your ideal be? Would it be part of a big family or a, or a small family? Is it good to be an only child and have to make your own entertainment and sometimes to be lonely and have company that too often is simply adults around you and having to listen to adult conversation? Or is it to be surrounded by brothers and sisters and have to fight for things and find brothers and sisters to be a total pain in the neck, but at least have people to, to have company with all the time and as the years go by, grow up with? Would it be the family that in fact you did come into? Or would you imagine that it would be some completely different family that you would be in. Some people's dream, you see, in the fairy tales would be that they would find that they were part of aristocracy or, or, or royalty. There was a king once called Louis XIV, the Sun King, the Great King, but he became king when he was only four years old and he was a very neglected and a very lonely and a very unhappy child. It's maybe not enough to be a king. And in the fairy tales that some of us read when we were small, and even in the pantomimes, the happy ending was that you married a prince, or married a princess, and you knew that if you did that, automatically, you lived happily ever after. And maybe we think that to marry a prince or a princess doesn't necessarily guarantee that either. What size of family was Jesus in, I wonder? Well, there's somebody in the Old Testament called Jesus. Let's think of him first. His name was, well, his name was Joseph, anyhow. And he was the last, the baby of a large family. And if you're the baby of a large family, you are either spoiled rotten or you have to be the dog's body for everybody fetching and carrying. And you put it long on all the time and you never get a bowl at all. Joseph was the kind who was spoiled rotten. But when his brothers had the chance to get their own back on him, they did. And they didn't just need to say to him, get lost. They made sure that he did get lost. And Joseph came good in the end because of what was in him. But it wasn't because he had been in a family of that size. Yes, what size of family did Jesus belong to? Do you remember? 
There was his mother, Mary, who became his mother when she was still in her mid-teens, very probably. There was Joseph, who possibly was much older than Mary. And Joseph perhaps died fairly early on, but not before Mary had had, it would seem from the New Testament, a lot more children. There are the four brothers whom Jesus is named as having, and his sisters are referred to. So that means that Jesus was one of not less than seven children, and the eldest of them, and therefore helping to support his mother and to support the younger ones. And so I suppose he would go into the family business, and after, his, after Joseph died, the one who was thought to be his father, he carried it on until the other children could be established, and then he could go and fulfill the destiny that he knew that God was calling him to, and that God unmistakably thereafter did call him to. But he didn't get on later with his brothers and sisters, or they didn't get on with him. In a sense, the holy family, as we sometimes talk about, was not in that sense an ideal family. Maybe there is no such thing as an ideal family. And maybe it's only people like the Pope, or like presidential candidates, who talk so much about family values, as though that meant simply the conventional, closely knit family, all caring for one another. I don't think family life can be like that nowadays because the family is so much wider and the world is so much smaller than once it was so that perhaps we all of us are brothers and sisters to one another and also to a great many other people. It's not the kind of beginning we had that matters. It's how we grow and how we mature and the people we turn out to be. Paul knew something about that, and he wrote about it, about how we all are, as we would say, we all are Jock Tamsons Burns, though he didn't say that. Let's hear what he said, please, Nigel, to the Ephesians. The um, reading from the New Testament is taken from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, at verse 1. This will be found at page 242 of the Good News Bible. Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 1. I urge you then, I who am a prisoner because I serve the Lord, live a life that measures up to the standard God set when he called you. Be always humble, gentle, and patient. Show your love by being tolerant with one another. Do your best to preserve the unity which the Spirit gives by means of the peace that binds you together. There is one body and one Spirit, just as there is one hope to which God has called you. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There is one God and Father of all mankind, who is Lord of all, works through all, and is in all. Each one of us has received a special gift in proportion to what Christ has given. As the scripture says, when he went up to the very heights, he took many captives with him, he gave gifts to mankind. And then at verse 11, it was he who gave gifts to mankind, he appointed some to be apostles, others to be prophets, others to be evangelists, others to be pastors and teachers. He did this to prepare all God's people for the work of Christian service in order to build up the body of Christ. And so we shall all come together to that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God. We shall become mature people reaching to the very height of Christ's full stature. Then we shall no longer be children, 
carried by the waves and blown about by every shifting wind of the teaching of deceitful men who lead others into error by the tricks they invent. Instead, by speaking the truth in a spirit of love, we must grow up in every way to Christ who is the head. Under his control, all the different parts of the body fit together and the whole body is held together by every joint with which it is provided. So, when each separate part works as it should, the whole body grows and builds itself up through love. Amen. In the morning of our lives, we need God. In the high noon of our lives, we need him. And in the evening of our lives, we need him. And Jesus called people at every stage of that. At the very beginning of life, he took little children in his arms and, and blessed them. He called a young man once to rise up and follow him, and the man was scared to do so, and Jesus was very sad. There was a man once who for 38 years, and I suspect that meant from the very beginning of his life, had been crippled and unable to face life fully. And when he was given the chance of a new beginning, he quailed from that and made excuses at the age of 38, and he's not the only one. And there was one man who was very senior indeed, in the civil service or in the church, and he asked once Jesus rather sadly, can a man be born again when he's old? Can he make a new beginning as if he was just a young man or as if he was a child? And Jesus suggested that all things are possible to the Spirit of God, and so it is. But when he covers us most is in the early days of our living, when we have everything ahead of us, when we can do so much for him and for his world. And then he calls us to rise up joyfully and follow him. But at whatever stage we are, in the long day of our life, we depend upon him and trust in him and sing to him. We'll sing hymn 92 to the tune slain, Lord of all hopefulness, Lord of all joy. I would invite you to make the offering now and while you're arranging that could I first of all welcome any people who are here as visitors today we hope you'll hang around for a little bit at the end and coffee will be through here and we'd love you to come down and could I also just point out for members of the Kirk session that next Sunday is not only a baptismal Sunday it's also a Sunday when there will be admission of one or two people to communion and that therefore there is a meeting of the Kirk session which won't otherwise be notified at 10.15 for the formal intimation of that before the service. The offering now. As always in these days, there's more for us to pray for than we know where to begin at. Let me give you time to make your own prayers of intercession, I think, today. And not least, perhaps, for all those grievous families that are scattered in so many places, in helplessness and in hopelessness. From our own congregation, let's remember the Walker family, who this last week, Donald and Judith and Hannah and Ewan, have gone back from us to Zambia after their furlough. Remember also Iona Blackwood, who has gone out to Guatemala to work in a school there for the greater part of the next year. And remember her, not just today only, but in the coming days in your prayers. Let us pray. Father, we dedicate to you this section of our wealth. We ask that it may be wisely applied, and we ask that we may have wisdom and common sense and responsibility in the use of all the wealth that you have given to us.
We make our prayer, Lord, for the world that is sad and frightened and bewildered. And for those particular parts of it whose images are before our eyes and in our ears. And those things that most the world needs, unity, sacrifice, love, hope, and peace. We pray too, Lord, for families in our own society and in our own community, whom we know to be under stress, whether there's illness or tension or unease, and all those things which now with our separate unspoken voices but with our common hearts of love and of concern and of faith we together would set silently before you. Hear us Lord and answer us as we pray for others and as we pray for ourselves. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And finally, a hymn to the same tune as the one that we sang at the beginning of the service to St. John, about our need and our desire for the grace of God to go with us through all the years of our living. Hymn 614, March on my soul with strength. Go forth then in the peace of God and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you evermore. and for ourselves, our own hopes, our own intentions, our own plans, our own inadequacies and our own fears, for all that may await us this week, and our own uncertainty about our competence to cope, for our own discipleship, Lord, that it may be renewed by you, that your strong hand may hold us and lead us and direct us, For this also we pray. And for the company of the redeemed, the faithful of every age, whose successors we seek to be, those who have gone before us, those who await us, and those whom we long to see. Thanks be to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, blessed forever. Amen. Hymn 593, a hymn which somehow catches up all the foundation upon which our faith is based, those who have gone before us, and what we ourselves in our day are called to do. Ye that know the Lord is gracious. Go in peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you, and remain with you evermore. Mm -hmm.